Your support helps us bring you programs you love. Go to wyomingpbs.org, click on support, and become a sustaining member or an annual member. It's easy and secure. Thank you. Funding for Dude Ranch Days was provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and the Wyoming Council for the Humanities. It's late spring in Wyoming. The hills are green again. Wildflowers are in bloom. And the horses are returning to Eaton's Dude Ranch from their winter pasture to the south. Watch it, on the, watch it! Ah! Hold it up! When we take them on this last stretch, you can really tell they, they know that they're close, and boy, sometimes it's pretty rough keeping them back. Now slow it up. I know in the spring they're coming up to our ranch, even though they're going to be ridden all summer by our guests. It doesn't seem to make any difference. All they want to do is get up to the ranch. They have a fairly good life. They're only ridden four months out of the year. They seem to enjoy the trip almost more than we do. How you doing, Dave? The 100-mile trip takes Frank Eaton, his two daughters, and the crew three days and two nights. But some of these wranglers aren't full-time cowboys. I'm an investment counselor from uh, Orange County, California. I'm a physician from uh, northern Ohio, outside Cleveland. I'm retired now, but I spent 35 years in the marketing and advertising business. Wait a minute, what are these guys doing here? Well, they're dudes, doing what people drawn to the West have done for over 100 years, playing cowboy. And despite three days of rain, they love it. This is my first year with the group. I heard about it uh, last summer when I was uh, visiting the ranch, and I said, that sounds like a lot of fun. It's been a real kick. I really enjoyed it. This is my fourth turn. I enjoy the whole part of rounding up horses, driving them a period of time, feeling like you're ready to die, <laughs> and then grub with the, the group. Great fun. Chewing tobacco, don't chew tobacco in a lot. This is my, I don't, I lost count, 14th or 15th trip. But this is a one of a kind thing. Uh, I don't know of any three day, 100 mile horse drives in America. And to be able to be a part of it and have fun, as we all do, because we, we like each other, is just an amazing, amazing experience. When John Wayne died, I stopped going to the movies. The Dude Ranch, that uniquely American place. Whether it's a working cattle ranch, or a luxury resort, or somewhere in between, the basic ingredients are the same. Beautiful country, good horses, and uh, families who offer uh, traditional Western hospitality. All wrapped up in the, in the romance of the Old West. I'm Lindsay Wagner, and I love it. My family loves it. We go to a Dude Ranch every year. You know, it all began in 1882 on a ranch owned by three brothers from Pittsburgh. It was Alden, Willis, and Howard Eaton. And their friends, who were lured by the romance of the West, they soon joined them. The Eatons had always been very hospitable people, and they were glad to see them and greeted them as friends and got horses for them and fed them and all. And finally, the friends realized that they weren't helping the Eatons at all with their cattle ranch. They were putting them definitely in the red. So they came to them and they said, look, we love it out here. We'd like to stay longer, but we feel that we should pay. At first, the Eatons said, oh, no. And then they began to look into their finances and decided, yes, perhaps it would be a good idea. So that was the beginning of the Dude Ranch. 
Some of the most successful early dude ranchers were from the East, often wealthy or well-educated, who understood what their guests were looking for. The ranchers often played on customers from their area because it was a very personal thing of contacting people they knew or people who had heard of them and then they were able to get them as their constant customers and guests on the ranch. The Eatons moved their ranch operation to Wolf, Wyoming in 1904 near Sheridan and Bighorn National Forest. Ranchers often picked spots where they would have access to other land where they could have easy uh, way to get the their customers to places they wanted to see, where they could fish, where they could hunt, where they could camp. And in the early days of the national forests and national parks and BLM land, the federal government was very sympathetic and even quite helpful to the ranchers as the two were working for the same thing to make people more aware of what was available and therefore build up the business for both. The Eaton said no guests that first year, but... Well, the dude said, oh no, we're coming. And 70 of them came, and they worked right along with the carpenters, and they helped with whatever they could. And as soon as the cabins were finished, in they moved. Before that, they lived in tents. They ate off of ironing boards. <laughs> they really had a wonderful time doing a lot of hard work. In those early years, even the dudes were usually wealthy. Well, they had to be. In the old days, it took so long to get here. They would stay a month or so. Some of them all summer. They'd come through Chicago, and, and then it would take two days from Chicago out here. Well, in the early days, they met them in Ranchester with a stagecoach. It's about 12 miles across the country, three hours anyway. My Uncle Will was driving, they went faster. I think. He scared half the dudes to death. <laughs> My grandmother used to say. In the old days, all they cared about was riding. And we did have a dance once in a while. Everybody just wanted to ride, mainly. Eaton's is still owned and operated by the original family, now in its fifth generation. Being one of the oldest of the fifth generation, that uh, is involved with the ranch, I really wanted to, to help ensure that the ranch is going to carry on for another five generations. All this rain is a bunch of rocks. It's exciting to think back what it was like here when the first generation, when the Eaton brothers arrived here, to think that I'm riding the same trails that they once rode. Um, and in a way, it's an honor to be a part of it and to be a part of the history. I suppose you want Eli back. I'd love Eli back. There have been some changes over the years. Now most guests stay for only a week or two. They prefer riding in small groups, and they want more organized activities and entertainment. But the patterns set long ago persist. Lifelong friendships, a favorite horse, returning guests who are grateful to find nothing's changed. What? The seat still fits? Still fits. Okay. Yep. Good for another year. Uh, there are the lasting, deep friendships that we make out here. Hit him between the ears. Thanks. We come back year after year. Sorry, Eli. Uh, there's a natural, true, straightforward way of life out here. Nice to see you That gets you back squarely on your feet again. I came here about 55 years ago with my father. I find I renew my perspective on things out here. It's something that gets into your blood. I saw all the cowboys here, and I thought to my wife, we will go there, and we do the same than a cowboy. I asked her, what will we do? Will we go for a dew branch, for a swimming pool and then tennis, or will we work? Oh, we go to work. We love to be a cowboy. Well, Hollywood had it right. For many people from all over the world, the chance to be a working cowboy, if only for a week, is the ultimate experience. There was a lot of people in cities that had no idea that you could actually come to a ranch and go on that kind of a vacation. And that's one thing Billy Crystal did for me.
of course, this Hollywood had to glamorize it a little. But the basics of what he brought to people in City Slickers is, is true. He went back to basic living, basic values, and, and that's what he returned to and so more or less found himself. You pretty much figure when you're catching horses out on the first day, you just you catch out your bomb-proof horses. So you you give them their bomb-proof horses, and you ride out the first day, and you look at them, and you watch them, and, and uh, then you can kind of rate them next time around a lot better. Because they'll, you know, they'll come out, oh, I ride all the time, you know, I ride every day. And Here you go, Alberto. Hi, Withers. They, they don't know kind of how to judge their own abilities. And they really don't know what they're up against as far as the terrain here and, and what's required of them and how the horses handle this country. We started our day uh, gathering enough cattle to brand for the day. Uh, they can gather just like anyone else. And uh, we make sure there's enough of us with them so they don't get tangled up or don't get to go in the wrong direction. Yeah, I keep coming back because uh, I, I really like this particular ranch. Uh, I love to ride. Um, I love how much space there is out here to ride in. Uh, you also get to learn how to ride something different, how to ride a cow horse, um, how to round up the cattle, uh, how to round up the horses, you know, when to stay, when to go, when to push, when not to. It's, it's a lot more complicated than it seems in order to get it right. We get a lot of work done with these people. We get all our work done. You know, you have to, you have to have your your experienced people mixed in with them. These people here this week, especially, are are return people. They knew what they what to do, and and uh, we went to work. Back about 15, 16, 17 years in there somewhere, uh, the cow business just went to the basement, and lots of outfits went broke, and we we was right next door to them. We decided at that time that we was going to do something that was not tied so close to agriculture. How guest ranches got started a hundred years ago is basically how we got started. We just uh, have had friends and relatives come and enjoy staying and so we um, thought that it would be interesting to see how, you know, what kind of a guest business we could start with. It took me about three years to talk my dad into, into trying, at least trying to have a few guests come to the ranch and sharing the, the lifestyle that I had always had as a kid. Finally one year he says, okay, he says, you get the people and he says, I'll do the rest. <laughs> I don't know why the, the, such a romantic idea of the cowboy life caught on so well. It was popular with the people from the east and, and people from even clear across the waters in, in Europe. They come out here to find people who are like that. And I don't think we're quite, quite as wild and woolly as, and western as those people in the books, but this is our way of life. I teach uh, mathematics at a college, and so being a cowboy out here getting tired and sweaty feels real good. We just uh, took the horses out uh, that we all have been riding today caps off the day and we know it's time for supper. Bed won't be far behind. We like to work hard. But not all dudes want to be a working cowboy. They're looking for a different experience, where saddling up means riding through beautiful country at their pace, not a cow's, and at the end of the day, relax in that time-honored cowboy way. I'd like a uh, spinach salad with a nice Merlot or Cabernet. A lot of the ranches in uh, Wyoming and Montana pretty much uh, were working cattle ranches that had, uh, had friends from back east come and visit them. In Colorado, probably more of the ranches uh, maybe start out as little cattle ranches and stuff like that, but hunting and fishing was always real big in the mountains of Colorado, and so uh, some of the ranchers found they could build these little cabins out alongside the streams, and uh, people would actually pay them to come stay at their, at their ranches. 
which is sort of the case of Drowsy Water Ranch. Along about the end of the 20s, a uh, clothing salesman from Chicago, his name was Pops Glesner, a great big 225 pound guy. He specialized, I believe, in ladies lingerie, which is a long ways from dude ranching. But anyway, uh, he uh, bought up these homesteads and started building Drowsy Water as a dude ranch. Okay, come close. This area of Colorado was um, known as the Dude Ranch Capital, and it's a great area. Uh, we have nice weather, few afternoon showers, beautiful views of the Continental Divide. Probably more than anything, uh, most all of the Colorado ranches, Colorado ranches, I'd say, are are based around a pretty strong uh, family-oriented program of entertaining people. The Montana and Wyoming ranches, being some of them second and third generation ranches, uh, really geared more around cattle and stuff, uh, found that that's about all they really need to do, was take people horseback riding and work the cattle and so forth. And as the uh, Colorado ranches, more of them weren't necessarily second generation people having these ranches. There were people like Drowsy Water that uh, actually built the ranch for a dude ranch. They found that people like things like square dancing and hay rides. We try to entertain people every single night. Horses are still the main focus for guests even the little buckaroos. While the parents are out riding, the kids ride around the ranch. Yeah. They learn to stop their horse and turn their horse and trot a little bit in the ranch. I guess the, uh, the thing we really wanted to do was have a chance to kind of do some stuff together. Well, I used to ride a lot when I was really young and my children really haven't had that opportunity to ride and I thought this would be a great vacation because it would get them on a horse and it would get me back riding a little bit. And, We've been out every day. Have fun. It combines a lot of things that I love. The nature and horseback riding and, and uh, the people being with the other people on the trail rides and learning uh, about this area and this land. I just, just like uh, getting out and, and relaxing and seeing the beautiful country with the horse doing most of the work. We have our Colorado blue spruce up here. I love to take trail rides and I enjoy sharing what I see out there with our guests. Um, I love the trees and the flowers. Well, we were fortunate enough today to see um, our black bear that still had a lot of her winter coat on. She's been coming for three years. She's a three-year-old. My favorite part is when we're halfway up the mountain and you can look down into a valley and up the mountainside and you just feel a part of it all. And time stands still. It doesn't matter that I have an office waiting and a life outside of here. It's just a suspension of time and that's really rich. To see these traditional dude ranches today gives you no sense of what it took to make them successful but members of those pioneering families remember well. When I was growing up, Jackson Hole was a very young country as far as development. It was just after the Depression, during the war, and everything that you had, you either made or canned, or canned meats, canned vegetables, you had your own gardens, uh, no electricity. It was the frontier in the modern age. The first year our water froze and Spike had to carry water from the creek, which is no mean feat. I made every drop count, believe me. And uh, we didn't have a telephone because the snow took the line down. Spike was trapping. And I was alone all day. I think that was the most difficult part. We thought that the dude ranchers were really fine people. They used to meet years ago in Billings at the Northern Hotel. Every year, we'd always go down and <laughs> see everybody. And they used to come in in their boots and 
the fancy clothes, you know. Oh, gee, we were impressed. <laughs> we thought dude ranching was the way to go. When we went into business in 1930, we charged $35 a week. And that included meals and a cabin and horses and a guide, everything. And everybody thought that was so expensive. <laughs> Didn't think we'd ever make it, but we did. Up early in the morning, and I was still usually going about midnight. Jeez, that was a tough time. When I married Billy Eaton, and of course was going to live out here, the mothers of my friends referred to me as poor Nan because they were sure that there were bears sitting on my front doorstep. There were Indians doing war dances around the cabins. Why did they feel like this? Where did people get these ideas about the West and the cowboy life? My father had collected all the same great books and I started reading them and I just lived the West. And that really, I think, started me wanting to go West, wanting to be a part of the West. Nan Wertman's experience is typical of the way in which most people learned about the West, from writers, artists, and entertainers whose work created and shaped the myths of the Romantic West and dudes' expectations of what they would find. In the late 19th century, no one was more influential uh, in writing about the West, particularly for the uh, upper classes in the East than uh, Theodore Roosevelt. Later, around the turn of the century, uh, people like Owen Wister had a profound impact on the traveling habits of uh, people who w became dudes and came out West uh, seeking to live the life of the Virginian. One of the most prolific of the Eastern writers who portrayed the West was Mary Roberts Reinhardt. I went first to the ranch. The new bear country was strange to me and I did not like it at the beginning. Now for 15 years it has been to me my second homeland. Land beautiful, beautiful beyond, beyond words. words. And here was a new life with the horse king and the cowboy knight. And my starved romanticism flourished there. I repeopled it with Indians and with buffalo. I even became a romantic figure myself to myself. When I tied a bright handkerchief around my neck and kicked my horse into a lope, I was on the trail. Hi-ho for the trail and the brave adventure. The ranch she writes about is Eaton's. The cabin where she stayed is still in use. She was probably the most popular or widely read writer of her day through the Saturday Evening Post and other popular magazines. I think she came to the ranch to write. In those days, of course, she came out here for weeks on end, unlike nowadays where people go to dude ranches for a week or two. So she could get quite a bit of work done and get away from the distractions of city life. And I think that's why she kept on coming back. Buffalo Bill uh, had the most profound impact of all. It was uh, Cody who really fashioned the cowboy as a uh, heroic character. Prior to that time in the dime novels and other presentation of the West, the uh, cowboys were unsavory characters with not very many redeeming qualities. Well, buffalo Bill could uh, put up a poster with uh, his own image and with a buffalo background and the lettering that simply said, I am coming, and the world would know what that meant. Uh, he produced a show that uh, uh, beginning in the mid-1880s and uh, stretching into the early 20th century that was a uh, uh, a marvel of organization. How do you think that? It might be on the left. But it was Hollywood more than any other source that has defined the Romantic West with its Indians, outlaws, and the cowboy hero with an interesting twist. Uh, cowboys themselves on the range uh, began to admire that hat that Tom Mix wore uh, and uh, began to uh, insist on a little more um, flamboyant uh, appearance, and so life did uh, imitate art in the uh, early, t uh, early 20th century. But undoubtedly, these are the kinds of images that dudes carried with them uh, when they came uh, out to the ranches. 
And what uh, cowboy hasn't taken a glance at himself in his own shadow as he's loped along the range? And indeed, uh, what dude hasn't uh, done that as well? That's part of the image. And for a dude ranch, the most important part of that shadow has four legs. I think what makes a dude horse special is that uh, they have a different rider you know, on a weekly basis, and they figure those people out, adjust accordingly, and in most cases, or else they wouldn't be here, take good care of those people. And at least one day a week, we have the kids, if they'd like to, to groom their horse. Emily, you got Miss Tonka? They get to know their horse. And we encourage people to, you know, pet their horse and talk to their horse. We personally know every horse, and we know what they do. Um, probably Randy more than me. Okay, just hang on to him. And We're very attached to him. We have a pasture that we keep sort of for the geriatric group that's retired, and they've provided a great service for our guests and for us through the years, and we just let them spend the rest of their years here eating grass. The love that many dude ranchers have for these horses is matched by their guests, big and little. And it's not surprising that a good dude horse often has a home for life. The best ones we use that I try to find when I'm buying them are old ranch horses. That 10, 12 years old, but you always need a few of those old dogs that just barely move along, but they're getting harder and harder to find. As far as, as getting horses for a dude ranch, I think this is one of the biggest problems for most dude ranches. This year, we had to go to South Dakota to pick up three horses that came out of Canada. Many dude ranchers used to raise some of their own horses, but not anymore. Not enough time and no experienced help. However, a few still carry on this tradition and are exploring new training techniques, especially what is called natural horsemanship. A lot of guests that come to ranches may not realize that walking quickly up to a horse's head, placing your hand on the horse's head, patting, it's really not the approach that's safest for the horse or for the human. Okay. I think one of the things with natural horsemanship and with this imprint training is you have an opportunity, a window of opportunity with these young babies to train them not to be frightened of those kind of experiences, to expect it. We try to get them used to everything that might happen so that we can provide the safest encounter with horses for all of our guests. Natural horsemanship comes from the Spanish school, which is more of an artistic and a partnership and a harmonious way to ride. And then there's the Germanic or Prussian school, which was more mechanical. You know, they needed all those horses for war and they needed hundreds of horses as quickly as they could. And that's really where the, the Old West riding came from. And uh, they didn't have time to sit around in the veranda and talk about horsemanship. You just brought them in like the corral like this and rope one and, and fought with him until you got him broke and tied him up and ride him out. But uh, you shouldn't have to do that to a horse because it's a trauma thing with them. You know? The old way, you have to just keep an eye on them because they do have some bad habits. <clears throat> These horses that you imprint, they're just a lot safer. But you can trust them and they trust people. Welcome to the world. We got a girl. But I think it's important to be just one of the natural events that's there at birth. And I think horses who have that early learning tend not to fear humans, dogs. I see this baby. Another way to show that you want to be a friend is very gentle breathing right into the nostril. It's kind of a polite way of saying hello in horse language. I'm gonna work on her feet for shoeing. I wanna touch them everywhere that I might need to touch them in case they were in any harm or needed uh, vetting. She's already trying to stand up. Oh, oh, oh. Look at her, sugar baby. Come see the baby. Several times in 12 hours, I'll teach her to lead. 24 hours, I'll trailer load her. She'll pretty much learn it all in the first two days. Hour and 15 minutes from 
bag to bottle. It's the warmest place you'll ever almost find. Almost two hours old. It's the warmest place in anybody's mind. Home ranch. Had a big morning. Colorado. A key part of any dude operation is the wranglers, cowboys who wrangle dudes instead of cows, who take care of horses, the gear, give lessons, and lead trail rides. Best thing for me about dude wrangle is wrangling the horses in the morning. When you get out in the morning, and you're just all by yourself out there, and, uh, and the sun's just coming over the hill, and uh, it's a little bit fresh. I think that's beautiful. That's best for me. I love taking people that I know have real harried lifestyles and live in the city and whatnot and showing them what this country is really like. Some people don't know what silence is. And you know, to get them into the timber where there's no sounds at all but the birds and this and that, that's rewarding for me to know that some people have never heard that before. But the first step is getting horse and rider together. That's the responsibility of the head wrangler. When I see a 12-year-old boy, I don't care what they tell me. He's a 12-year-old boy. And I know what that means. And I have my 12-year-old boy horses. Sometimes I'll even uh, fudge a little bit and put him on a horse that anybody can ride, but just tell him, you know, this is old killer here. And <laughs> you got 200 head of horses you got to keep track of and when the guests come you find out how they ride and then try to match horse with the right guest. So after they ride four or five days they may want a horse that has a little more spirit. If you get people that come that want a different one every day, well, they make up things they don't like about the one they had. Or... We had a guy coming um, here a couple falls ago and he wouldn't ride an ugly horse by god it didn't matter if that was the best horse on the face of the earth if he was ugly he wasn't going to ride it <laughs> i think uh, dude wrangling hasn't changed a whole lot but the dude wranglers have changed you just don't find the ranch kids uh, going into dude ranching and you get more people who have a romantic in inclination to love the west from the, say from the eastern midwest or west coast Many of these cowboys, even the head wranglers, are now cowgirls, and for good reason. Wranglers! Hello? Dan! Jen! They're better communicators. You know, in this day and age, the, the, the dude, the guest, is so much more demanding. And uh, it, it takes a bit of a diplomat to, to uh, handle the people, and uh, women are very good at that. People who have been cowboys for a long time, I think, sometimes have a hard time taking orders from women. My guys are just fantastic. We work as a team, and I respect them, and I think they respect well, me as well. It's kind of muddy over there. In the old days, the wrangler who took you out on trail often doubled as the entertainer, but not these days. It is hard to find a, a dude ranch wrangler who's an entertainer. Of course, you know, the entertainment runs the gamut uh, on a dude ranch. There's staff plays and staff shows, and uh, we're fortunate to have uh, Marcos from Mexico, who's a vaquero and does a, a Mexican rope show on the back of his horse. Entertainment is, has been, always been a big part of my life. I've always enjoyed playing around the campfire and singing songs, and uh, I think that's part of the Western culture. I didn't have much talent, but you get them out 30 miles from town, you feed them a big meal, get them in a chair, and you got them. They can't go anywhere. <laughs> Thank you.
When the cold and deep snows shut down most northern ranches, dudes for years have headed to the southwest, especially Arizona, exchanging high mountains and alpine meadows for sagebrush and red rock canyons. Arizona dude ranches clustered around places where the train stopped, Phoenix, Wickenburg west of Phoenix, and Tucson. Some, like the Circle Z, close to the Mexican border, retain the feel of a simple old-time ranch with its cottages of handmade adobe. But many are like the White Stallion Ranch, a classic resort-style guest ranch with saguaro cactus and a full range of activities. The Arizona ranches differ from northern ranches in a lot of ways. Um, Arizona ranches, of course, have a longer season, probably in most cases at least twice as long. Ours are six to nine months and theirs are usually three or four months in length. People are really focused on weather when they come here. It's a way to escape the, the winter cold and snow. And, and uh, as a result of that, I think they really look at our, our outdoor facilities. Another thing probably that distinguishes the ones in the southwest is uh, the fact that they are relatively close to urban areas. Uh, so they have all of the urban amenities too. People can come and they can live in the western atmosphere, but within a half an hour they can go to the big city, they can go to shopping. Uh, they can go to nightclubs, they can go to restaurants. One of the most noticeable differences between the northern and our southwestern ranches is, is seen in the buildings. Where uh, they often have log buildings, we have the Mexican and Spanish style. Stucco, arches, lots of patios. Guests are always asking us how our ranch got its name. Well, actually, the owner previous to us wanted to name it after his very favorite horse story, the Black Stallion. But late on, he realized that the initials BS weren't going to look very good on a cow's hip. And so at the last minute, he changed the name to White Stallion Ranch. Ironic, since white horses get sunburned in Arizona, and you rarely see any. Our uh, family experience uh, in the dude ranch business started kind of tough. We were wakened about 6.30 in the morning by the maintenance man, pounding on my parents' back patio door. And uh, he was holding a big knife. He said, Mr. True, he says, you've been a great boss in the three weeks I've worked for you, and I just want you to know I'm going up now to kill Louise the cook. And when I'm finished, I'm going to Washington to kill Lyndon Johnson, our president. And my father, never a fan of LBJ and a very dry kind of man, without hesitation turned to the guy and said, well, I can't have you hurt Louise the cook, but I'll definitely get you a ticket to Washington. And then, of course, took the knife away and took him to Tucson. You got to do anything you can to save a cook. You know, in his book, Diary of a Dude Wrangler, Struthers Burt wrote, there are two key ingredients to a successful dude ranch, good horses and good food. And that is the truth, because dudes everywhere love to eat, often and a lot. And it all starts with the cook. Oh, well, that is the bane of any dude ranch. You get some marvelous cooks but you get some perfectly awful ones. Trying to find a good cook will work on a dude ranch is a problem to start with. If you put an ad in a paper, you're going to get a lot of inquiries. Go ahead, watch out for them. <laughs> and we had people call up and say they could cook. They couldn't even make gravy. Down the road they go. People that come to ranches expect wonderful food. They may diet every day of their lives, but they hit the ranch, they don't want just junk. And um, so the cook is a very special person. And um, you try to keep her happy because if a cook walks out on you, then the manager is usually the cook. And that's not a great deal of fun, I can tell you. Fairly early on, um, particularly on the Northern Plains, cow outfits began to provide more amenities for their uh, cowboys, uh, not only a chuck wagon, but also uh, began to bring in tables and chairs and create a more uh, family type of setting uh, in early cow outfits that's uh, uh, lapped over into uh, the sort of family style cooking and serving that you see on dude ranches today. Our guests come from all over. They come singles, couples, young, old, and especially those singles. It gives them an opportunity to sit with somebody and not feel like they're alone. They're, they're part of the ranch family. 
Here at the Buffalo Bill Historical Center, we have uh, two or three different chuck wagons. This one uh, uh, here, this outfit, uh, represents a typical uh, outfit on the Northern Plains uh, in the 1930-1940 vintage. It's really a, a kitchen cabinet uh, uh, with a work table which uh, folds up for uh, transport. Morning. All right. How are you? Good. We'll bring you all the way up here. The chuck wagon nowadays often has four-wheel drive. But eating out on the trail is always popular. All right. Steak, right? Steak, right? Yeah, big steak. Are you hungry this morning? There's times in my big skillet I'll scramble up to 200 eggs. Invariably, uh, every once in a while, something happens. And there's been times when we've had everything all prepared and the guests all with their plates in line and the wind started blowing. And uh, one time it was so bad that people could actually hold their plates up and I'd just lay the eggs up and they'd flop right onto it. And they were, of course, salt and peppered with dirt and dust and everything like that. Even the best can run into trouble. A flat tire on the way to camp can be the least of it. There was a bull that had had died in the middle of the road. <laughs> so we had to get around it. So it was probably 10, 10, 30 when we got to camp to feed the crew. <laughs> and we didn't have our meal ready. And of course the boys didn't know, the cowboys didn't know that the bull had died. So they grabbed the pickup with all of our stuff in it, went back up the road to where it was, and we were midnight feeding these people. But it taught us a great lesson. It taught us to have our meals ready and be prepared for anything. Get over. Okay. Okay. Dudes didn't always stay on the ranch. Pack trips were part of dude ranch life from the earliest days. Okay. 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 This trip just happens to be with a couple from uh, England. Make sure these are even. They're going actually very light because they're going to camp every night right at Timberline, uh, which is going to make it a, actually an exquisite trip, but a physically fairly demanding trip. Our national parks were always favorite places for early pack trips. One of the best publicized was led by Howard Eaton through Glacier National Park in 1915. However, Yellowstone National Park was the most popular destination. Eaton's Ranch pioneered these trips in the late 1800s, bringing everything, guests, horses, and supplies by train to the north entrance. By the turn of the century, that annual pack trip was well established to Yellowstone National Park. Today, the National Park Service uh, has a very open policy toward outfitters and packers. Um, they are allowed to come into Yellowstone with a special permit in the same fashion that uh, Howard Eaton and Pretty Dick Randall did so long ago. The Howard Eaton Trail was established in Yellowstone in tribute to him for his 40 plus years of, of pack trips uh, in and through early Yellowstone. And it is a trail that still runs through the park. It essentially parallels our Grand Loop Road system. Well, as you've seen this morning, you can tell the, the amount of logistics and planning and so forth it takes for a trip of this size. There's only four of them. They're only going to be gone for a week. And it's kind of mind-boggling to uh, uh, think about, you might say, our forefathers, the, such as the Eatons and the Larums that uh, used to take guests for a month, six weeks. And my gosh, they'd have, oh, 60, 70, 80 guests, probably 25 or 30 help, a couple hundred head of horses and pack, pack meals. They went with crystal, they went with wine, they went with tablecloths, uh, they went with shower tents. They had maids that went along, that made, uh, made all the beds up and uh, they had a big tent, like a small circus tent. It was a dining room. And of course, they had a big cook tent. It, it was a great thing. On them big trips, it was deluxe. I've talked to some of the people that were, they used to work at the ranch when I came 50 years ago. They still, some of them worked there that went on them trips. I hear them talk about it. And it was really a thrilling experience for them, and I know it would have been for me getting up in the mountains and you'd go on and on, just riding on the trail, never look back.
The era from about 1910 to 1930 is often considered to be the golden era of dude ranching. And this is during the time period when, partly because of World War I, lots of people went to the Western United States and enjoyed it. And it's not a coincidence that that's the time period when the Dude Ranchers Association started in the 1920s. They had, were going along well and they decided they need more organization. Uh, one couple had advertised their ranch as having running water. And when people got to the ranch, they found there was running water in truth, but it was in the creek. They felt that uh, there had to be something that uh, guaranteed the truth in advertising. And I think that was one of the main reasons the association was started. The railroads helped the dude ranches immeasurably. More people were becoming interested in them and the long trips they made were all to the railroads good. They had a photographer who came out and made the rounds of all the ranches and took pictures that uh, they used in their advertising. Max Goodsill of the Northern Pacific was the head of the people division of the railroad. And he helped individuals set up trips, uh, made arrangements for people to be met. He was excellent help to the dude ranchers. After the golden era, many dude ranches closed their doors. The depression, poor management, and high operating costs contributed to this decline. Others have been acquired by the National Park Service or purchased for corporate retreats and private homes. In the Southwest, there was also increased competition for vacationers with Hawaii and ski resorts. And rapid urban growth gobbled up many of the other ranches. When we came in 1965, there were about 30. And uh, Tucson was already a growing place, and my father saw that. And when he picked this ranch to buy, of the five that were for sale, he saw that it had the longest term future. And now that there are three ranches left within one hour of Tucson, um, I guess his uh, foresight has been borne uh, out to be correct. Dick Randall's OTO Ranch near Yellowstone National Park was one of the most famous of this golden era. The ranch officially opened its doors in 1912 and eventually consisted of over 5,000 acres. And the business just kept growing bigger and bigger and bigger and, and uh, every fall and winter he would make a trip out east, New York and, and the bigger cities and strum up some more business. For the most part it, it ended its operation or began a downhill slide in the 30s, 1930s. Uh, his children attempted to keep it open longer, but they didn't have the knack that Dick did to operate it, and they eventually sold it. And the Boris Service wound up with it. Uh, I think sometimes we can feel the past. Uh, I have, have been up here by myself, uh, early in the morning or late in the evening. And when it's real quiet out, uh, you can almost hear the riders coming in from the trail rides. Sometimes you can even hear voices. Uh, uh, people talking softly to each other. Uh, the riders talking to their horses. Probably all imagination, but it's there. You get up in the morning and you go outside and you smell that fresh air and you look around you and it's, it's beautiful all over again. 
At first, my mother didn't want to buy the ranch, but my dad kept talking, and finally she said, well, if I can look to those mountains to the south, every morning when I get up, I'll let you throw our lives away. And after all these years, we keep looking south. I knew when I was eight years old, I wanted to be a rancher. <laughs> So I, there was no question about deciding, I just knew. I love it, I get up every morning and look out at it and it just, you know, it takes your breath away. It's wonderful. Such feelings about the land are not new. Dude ranchers have a long tradition of environmental concerns as individuals and through the Dude Ranchers Association, reflecting the work of members such as Ernie Miller, Larry Larum, and Charles Moore. The beauty of the Western land was part of what drew these men to the West. They cooperated with the different people in the National Park Service or the National Forest Service, and they tried hard not to let any of this land be developed. It would be easy to say that such actions were simply good business, enlightened self-interest, but that's not the whole story. It's being part of the land. You feel it. Oh, you smell it. You're very aware of it and you respect it and you cherish it. And by gummy, when my girls get it, I want it to be every bit as beautiful. Well, of course, that, uh, you want to take care of it because that's your livelihood. But why, why change it? Let's just keep it the way it is. Let's let it be beautiful and let's let the animals have a place here and, and, and still make a living off of it. We've all been uh, very conservation-oriented, mother's family and my father's family both. So when you see changes in other areas of Montana, Wyoming, where they've logged, where they've dammed, where there's been erosion because of bad management techniques of grazing or something, you realize how important it is to plan for that. So that's part of what we've always done. And I got really involved in wilderness issues, and Dad did too. So we finally got a wilderness bill passed for our area. We have uh, a conservation easement on the ranch, so in per perpetuity this will remain the same, this land. There were a lot of developers that were after it. We couldn't stand the thought of turning it over to developers, because we had been down around Denver and come back up along the mountains. And we just couldn't bear the thought of this place looking like that. So we sold to Nature Conservancy. Lucia Nash first visited the Circle Z Ranch with her sister and parents when she was 10 years old. They continued to come until World War II. I was very fortunate that in my family, uh, an interest in nature was something that was expected. Um, we were always looking things up, and he was particularly liked it out here because there was such a variety. By osmosis, we, my sister and I both, have continued to have this interest in nature and the importance of it in one's life. Twenty-eight years later, she returned to the Circle Z with her own family. Wait for me. We one day happened to walk into the county supervisor's office that was in Patagonia. He was also a real estate agent. And to our horror, we looked on the walls and saw these huge maps of all the areas that the guests at Circle Z rode on. On these maps were driveways and roads platted out in ranchettes. So with great trepidation, we decided that we would buy this area, a uh, couple of thousand acres, just to save it. No other thought, just to keep the development away. Two years after we bought the property, we uh, found out that the ranch was for sale. So we took a deep breath and said, well, let's buy it. <laughs> And I felt always grateful that I could offer to other people the same kind of experience that had meant so much to me in my life. It was always such fun to meet new people, most people, uh, who like this kind of a life.
pretty good Joes, you know. <laughs> okay, is everybody ready? Whether it sounds corny or whatever. Get them out. The rewards come from uh, people who leave here uh, saying they've had the best vacation they've ever had. Have a good ride, everybody. Okay. All right, thanks. Um, you're not in the business if you're looking to make money. It's not, uh, it's not that kind of a business. It's a lifestyle choice. I can't imagine a life more satisfying and more daily fun. And so there is a timeless quality to a dude ranch, where the essential experience is unchanged. It remains a place where people can get back in touch with the natural world, where families can get back in touch with each other. A place where lasting friendships are made, where spirits are renewed. A place where the Old West lives on. To order a video cassette of Dude Ranch Days, call PBS Home Video at 1 800 Play PBS. Funding for Dude Ranch Days was provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and the Wyoming Council for the Humanities.